Okay. Um, uh, so thank you very much for attending uh, this debate, which I'm sure will be a lively one. In fact, I can promise that on a very important issue, um, which is uh, whether our regulatory proposals um, have made uh, reforms have made the, the financial sufficient financial system sufficiently resilient. Uh, before we start, I just to make one request. You're going to need your um, smartphones for voting and things like that, but we would rather not have calls in the middle, so I would request that you put them on silent. Um, so before we even start, uh, before I do anything that will pollute your, your original views on this topic, you're going to be asked to vote on the resolution that you have in front of it, which is post-crisis financial reforms have made the system sufficiently resilient. And I think you're going to be explained, I hope, how you're going to go about the voting. Is this correct? Oh, yes, there is a, a, a magic channel, which you have to go to. The URL is there. And you go on that, and I presume if you, it comes up with the possibility of voting. I'm told it takes about two minutes, so we're going to keep that going for about two minutes. And we will find what you vote at the beginning, and then we will take your vote at the end, and we will see how your minds have been changed, if at all. There has also been a, already a public vote on this, but in order not to influence you in any way, you will be told what the public vote's view on this um, was um, uh, um, uh, at the end. I should remind you that this is on the record. It's being webcast, um, so everything you say, uh, if we come to it later, will be known by everybody. Now, um, secondly, I want to introduce the panel uh, very quickly. Uh, um, we, uh, I'll do it from a um, person immediately to my left off to the further to my left. So immediately to my left is Anat Admati, who is uh, Professor of Finance and Economics of Stanford Graduate School of uh, uh, Business uh, and has written a wonderful book on this topic called, I think, The Banker's News Close? Yes. Um, uh, you will find her, out her position if you don't know as the debate proceeds. Uh, next to her is Pietro Carlo Paduan, who is now Minister of Economics and Finance of Italy, and before that was at the OECD, I think that's correct, and whom I've known for many years. Um, and next to him on his left, this is slightly Italian, isn't it? Uh, well, that's not the worst thing, um, uh, is Mr. Andrea Indria, who's Chairman of the European Banking Authority in London. Um, and finally, uh, to his left is Mr. Urs Rono, who's chairman of the board of directors, Credit Suisse Group in Switzerland. And I don't think, right, he, being here, I need to explain what that is. Um, so uh, the debate is about an incredibly important topic. We have um, had, a, obviously, a huge crisis uh, in 2007-8, and ongoing problems in Europe, really very significant ones in the Eurozone, uh, uh, a monumental government rescue, I mean, really staggering in its scale and depth, and since then, a whole host of very active and complex reform processes covering the capital of banks, the liquidity of banks, resolution processes for banks, the structure of the financial system and of the banking industry, um, the, the operation of the derivatives business trading more broadly and clearing houses, and in addition, and I, this is not exhaustive, also macroprudential, the introduction of frameworks for macroprudential policy which are relatively formal and deliberate. And the question we have is, is this enough or, as some people feel, even too much? Uh, uh, so this is why we've got a very clear debate. Can we perhaps have the answer to the question now? Where, where are we standing? So uh, it's a little bit more than two to one against. You're all pretty happy with what's been done. Uh, not all. Uh, two to one. Uh, two, of, uh, two thirds of you, or slightly more than two thirds of you, think that it's been okay. So let's see how that. Oh, oh, no. Sorry. Oh, I apologise. So, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Two to one against. I apologize. <laughs> I misread my own, uh, own, own, res own motion. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, so 32% agree it's sufficiently resilient. Well, that's funny because the way this is structured is it's quite a few of the speakers. More of the speakers will be on the, the minority position than the majority position. So the way we're going to proceed with it is uh, uh, each speaker will have the opportunity to speak four minutes or so. I'm going to give the last speaker slightly more time because her position is really radically different, I think, and I think it's important that it be expressed. So... Um, that's how we'll proceed. We'll have a little discussion amongst ourselves and then uh, opportunity for you to interject. I am going to try, if we've got enough time, this is an, an experiment, it may turn out to be very, very foolish, to allow you to express on one point uh, a position on this uh, resolution, Just, but you have to do so very, very briefly. So you have to think that nobody may make, a, if we have get to Q&A, a comment for more than about 20 seconds. But you can make one point, this is what I like or this is what I don't like. Otherwise, it will be a normal questions and then a brief sum up at the end. So uh, that's how we will proceed. Uh, and let me start, if I may, with uh, Mr. Enria. So thank you very much and uh, good afternoon. Uh, I came this morning straight from the Asian Financial Forum in Hong Kong, where a similar question was put to the audience, 2,500 uh, market participants, and the same percentage was there okay. uh, at the beginning and even worse at the end, so bleak for regulators. And actually, it was coupled with another question on whether regulator, the, the, the regulatory reform is stifled growth, and the answer was uh, massively yes. So we didn't do enough, and we stifled growth, so pretty bleak. I'll try to, uh, to start then with a positive message, but then I'll try to be very conditional in, uh, in, the, my, in my positive answer. The positive message is that uh, I look out to banks in particular because that's my job. Uh, uh, let's say uh, what was needed was to strengthen the, uh, cap the banking sector, strengthen the capital of the banking sector in particular, uh, Basel III moving in that direction, and uh, uh, most international banks now have uh, uh, complied with the Basel III fully loaded requirements. And uh, uh, at uh, the end of 2011, there was a shortfall of approximately half a trillion euros. So the capital strengthening that occurred uh, has been significant, has been significant also in Europe. We at the EBA have done quite a lot in that direction. Uh, the capital requirements have been coupled, the, the, the risk weight requirements have been coupled with the leverage ratio, liquidity, I mean, a, 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 a harsher requirements for securitization and capital market activities, derivatives. I think that this is uh, what we need. We need, uh, sometimes uh, the, the bank has argued that this is becoming too complex, that there are too many requirements. I would argue that uh, uh, whenever we set a requirement that is, of course, a run for uh, circumvention, we need to have a belt and braces approach and try to have uh, more requirements in place at the same time. It is argued that this is stifled growth. All the evidence I've seen is against this. I mean, banks, with, countries which have uh, uh, done the reforms more quickly are the countries which are growing faster, and the banks which have uh, stronger, capital require, stronger capital are the banks which are lending more into the economy, which have gained market share, and which have sh cheaper funding costs. On the conditional side, uh, uh, we would be, uh, I think, uh, wrong in saying that uh, the job is done, that we have, uh, uh, that we have completely won uh, the battle and that uh, we can declare victory. Uh, I think that there are at least two points on which uh, uh, there is still a big challenge in terms of implementation and calibration of the requirements. The first one is, uh, is the too big to fail. There we are still quite far away from uh, uh, from the result, uh, and I think that the calibration of the requirements on loss absorbing capacity will be quite key. And uh, when I mean quite key, I, I, I want to say that it would be important to make it credible that also large institutions can be let fail without bailout. We need to have uh, uh, conservative requirements for loss absorbing capacity, and this should be, in my view, uh, much more focused on equity than on debt. The second point is uh, 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 internal models at banks. Uh, the, the requirements are, are focused on uh, internal models and risk weighted assets. Uh, they need to be risk based, but still, let's say, there is a loss of confidence in these internal models, and we need to fix that. Uh, we are doing a lot of work in that uh, direction. We need to work in different uh, uh, along different strands, uh, uh, transparency, uh, fixing the supervisory approaches, uh, fixing the banking models. We are, uh, we are quite committed to doing that, but that will be also crucial to really restore credibility in the regulatory framework. I will, I will stop here. Thank you. 
So to, it would be fair to summarize this as yes, but, yes. but the conditions you put are quite significant ones. Yes. Since they relate to both loss absorbing capacity and the viability of the internal models, yeah. uh, the risk weighting mm -hmm. procedure. Um, very helpful. If I may now turn to you, Mr. Rona. Um, yes, thank you. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I would take a slightly more positive view in terms of what has been achieved so far. I still have some buts as well uh, towards the end, uh, but they may be a bit different from the ones that Mr. Nia had. I think that uh, regulators have identified strong policies to address systemic financial risks, and the uh, reform agenda has, in my opinion, been effective in addressing the two key shortcomings that led to the 2007 financial crisis, weak uh, capital resilience and the, o the obvious uh, issue of uh, too big to fail. Now, the resilience, let's look at those uh, individually. The resilience of banks has been seriously strengthened over the last couple of years. Capital requirements have gone up by a multiple of the pre-2008 level, five to ten times, according to uh, Mr. Carney. In addition, regulators also in both America and Europe have added stress tests, very strenuous stress tests, I would say, which are a new form of capital test and most often a very uh, tough or tougher one. In response to regulatory market pressures, sometimes it's not just the regulatory pressures because we had long, long uh, periods of time for phasing in, but market pressure was such that uh, banks had to restore, restock capital for losses uh, much quicker uh, and added probably roughly a trillion to their equity base uh, since the crisis. The model-based uh, risk calculations, you have referred to that, uh, Mr. have been improved. Capital floors will be widely introduced to avoid the risk that risks are systema systematically underestimated and to ensure that the level of capital across the banking system does not fall below a certain level. And uh, stress tests, as I said, are used to size appropriate capital buffers for individual banks on, based on their individual models that they are having, which I think is a sensible approach. Moral hazard was addressed. I think in the banking sector, moral hazard was addressed. I'm not sure it, in a lot of sectors it was in the same manner addressed. Compensation is much more long-term oriented, and clawbacks are introduced, or malice provisions are exercised. And uh, I can tell you from our own experience in our company, they're tough and they work. Conduct rules generally have been toughened, and have been toughened much more even in the most recent past, and are enforced. And de detailed recovery and resolution plans have been introduced, are maintained, and have to be uh, upkept uh, as we go along. Bail-in, which will be accomplished through the implementation of the standard for total loss absorbency capital, better known as TLAC, is now sort of the last missing piece according to the FSB. There is still a debate going on on the, on the precise calibration. Uh, I think it, we have always been very positive and in favor of, uh, of actually of TLAC and of bail-in. For a long time, I think it's a, it's a sensible way to address the issue. So if I were to, to look, we have seen a paradigm shift on two fronts. We have made banks more resilient with much more equity, and we have a backup plan in case this is insufficient, one that maintains critical functions in place for the real economy, even if a bank fails. That's done via, on the one, the one hand, bail-in, and on the other hand, on the other hand uh, via um, resolution plans, and sometimes also organizational restructuring of, of banking organizations, as it is currently happening in Switzerland, but also in other countries where, you know, basically most banks or many banks move more, much more towards a holding concept uh, model. I think this provides a much more resilient financial sector to support the economy and also ensures that banks are held responsible for their own mistakes, just like any other company in the economy, which in my opinion, that was the biggest shortcoming and that's something which effectively everybody, probably also here on the panel, would subscribe to, we have to effectively deal with. Now, while these core reforms have been successful, they are not fully implemented. We are still, I mean, I would say in some instances on the way to doing that, at least, even though you know, it's by and large clear where we have to go to. There are a couple of things I would like to mention that are my buts. One is regulate, some regulators are pursuing a so-called reforms based on national and product ring fencing. I think if you do that across a global financial system, um, I don't think that's the right solution for the system. It makes it much more, even more difficult, more complex, and I would argue as a result of the misalignment of some of the, of the regulations that would ev eventually have from that uh, so complex that IT and operational costs and the re associated risks will increase with the result that uh, you will 
probably not achieve fully what you had in mind, namely to make the system uh, more <coughs> resilient. I think the fixed income sector in particular is suffering from some post-crisis overreaction, in my opinion. Some of the changes have been really punitive. Um, we have reduced our fixed income sector by more than 50%, um, but uh, lack of mar market making can make markets more volatile, less liquid, and that's dangerous if you want to uh, want a resilient market-based financing going forward. And uh, as I said, intensive regulatory supervision has a lot of benefits, but if you have to deal with different uh, regulators and supervisors across the globe on the, on the same topic in a different fashion, then I don't think this is what we ultimately want to get to. And I would say the biggest shortcoming to this effect is the fact that we do not still not have um, a, uh, I would say, a new, uh, a new universally accepted system for resolution or for mutual acceptance of resolution systems across the globe. We have uh, fundamental principles. The FSB has come up with those. Um, and by and large, we all go into a similar direction. But the ultimate litmus test is that, you know, we have systems in place among at least the global, the global CIFIs and uh, the respective jurisdictions that irrespective as to where a crisis is to occur, you have a system in place that will work and will work also, uh, I think, over a relatively short period of time. It's achievable, it's doable. I think a lot of the things we have been doing in terms of single point of entry doctrine, in terms of restructuring the organizational structures and so forth, and bail-in will help to this effect, but we have to make sure that some sort of distrust that I see sometimes between different national regulators or, or uh, some jurisdictional issues uh, can be appropriately resolved to, to finally deal with that issue. That's, I would uh, stop here. Thank you very much. That's wonderfully clear and, uh, and helpful in framing the debate and position and introduces another set of really important issues, which, which is the relationship between, as it were, global institutions and national regulation, broadly defined, and the, how that works. So the third speaker is, is you, Mr. Pedro. Thank you, Martin, and good afternoon to everybody. I guess I put myself in the camp of yes, but as well. Uh, which means it's a conditional yes, conditional upon three main points. First of all, that we're actually looking at a process and not just a standstill point, an equilibrium point, and this process is still ongoing. Second, that this process is very much uneven across countries, regions, and sectors of the, of the industry. And third, that my understanding of, of uh, financial sector reform after a major financial crisis is that it has to do with two interconnected yet different elements. One is repairing the financial system, and the other one is redesigning the financial architecture. Sometimes we tend to mix these two things, but the, the two things, of course, go hand in hand, and the complication from the point of view of the policymaker is to try to, to distinguish these and take the right actions. Uh, you will excuse me, if also given my current occupation, I take a more macro perspective to this, and I say that the answer to that question depends on which, on very much in which macro environment you're standing. And from my point of view, if I look back at, say, five to, to, to six years back, and I look at, say, European experience vis-a-vis -vis the American experience, I noticed another thing, that the impact of success of financial sector repair and financial reform also depends on other policy areas, including the way they're sequenced. Let me give you the obvious example. Uh, if you take the US and if you take the Euro area, not just the EU, but the Euro area, then and if you ask the question, what was done first? Was it financial sector repair or fiscal adjustment? Then the answer is exactly the opposite in the two regions. This has produced a huge difference in terms of outcome of any financial sector repair. You might do the exercise. Pardon me, I'm a, 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 an academic by training, so I tend to be very abstract. But imagine that you introduce the same financial sector measures the two regions, but you change the sequencing, then you have very different results in terms of how much resilient is your system at the end of the process and what does it deliver in terms of growth and jobs, which is ultimately my preoccupation. So in assessing, one, uh, this, this should be taken into account. Second point, and here, since uh, time is running fast, let me concentrate on Europe. 
uh, again, I think we are very much looking, especially in the euro area, at the interaction between financial sector repair and changing the architecture of the system. In the euro area, what I have in mind is the struggle to have the banking sector back into normal functioning, and this may have very different implications in different countries in the euro area, and at the same time, improving the way the European and the euro area financial system, not the banking system alone, financial system operates. So we have, we have as policymakers, have a task to do both. And we have to do both things at the time when growth is lagging or lacking or simply absent. Final point, uh, uh, policymakers have to keep the, this interaction in mind when they design and implement reforms. They have to talk closely, although keeping their independence, with people responsible for macro policies, because the ultimate success of the introduction of measures has to do also with the, as I said, with the macroeconomic impact. My last point is where do we go from here, especially in Europe? Well, we have, I think, to uh, look hard at how the division of labor between national action to regulate, deregulate, or repair the system go hand in hand with the European level. Uh, countries still have a lot to say and a lot to do in terms of improving their financial system in Europe. Let me put you with a piece of advertisement. The Italian government yesterday approved a major banking reform. Uh, uh, which has now to be approved by Parliament. I hope they will do that. This, of course, has a lot to do uh, in, uh, in, in the way in which the Italian financial system will integrate with a rapidly changing European financial system. So one challenge I had, and this is my last point, is that we have to think hard how national regulators, national policymakers, and European regulators and European policymakers interact in shaping the future of the European financial system while at the same time we finally complete the repair, the, the repair of the financial system. Thank you. May I just ask one follow-up question to make sure that I understand it? Um, you were contrasting as crucial, uh, as I understood it, the fact that, in your view, the U.S. fixed the financial sector first and did fiscal consolidation later, while the Eurozone did it the other, yes. other way around. Would it be your view that with the measures, that, and it's not quite clear to me, that with the measures that have now been taken, banking union, uh, asset quality review, et cetera, stress tests, that the Eurozone has now caught up? Has now caught up, but it finds itself at a much more disappointing growth environment than would have been resulted from a different sequencing. Because essentially of, of about four or five years delay. Well, right. let yes. me put it differently. If you have a policy tool, it be it monetary policy or fiscal policy, the impact of that depends on how strong the stimulus is, but also on the transmission. And the transmission depends on how the, well the financial system operates. Okay. This is the point. <coughs> and now, your response Thank you. to what has been said. Well, I'm going to probably... Um, Good afternoon, everybody. I'm probably going to take uh, a bit of all the buts that were said here and add a little bit more. So to the question of this panel, uh, whether the system is sufficiently resilient, uh, I strongly uh, object uh, to the statement. I'm glad two-thirds of you, or almost two-thirds of you, uh, come in this way. I hope to uh, convince even more of you that that's the case. because. It's not just that it's not sufficiently resilient. It's not resilient by any measure. Uh, in fact, it's incredibly fragile. And that is not to say that you might find measures under which it's uh, somehow better uh, than some other time. Uh, I actually don't think it's that much better as a whole than, uh, than it was before. By some measures, it's, uh, it's potentially even worse. So too big to fail was mentioned, so let me start there. There are about uh, 28 global CIFI, systemically important financial institutions. Most of them have, are much larger now than they were in 2006, so just keep that in mind. They are very large by any standard, just about the, most, uh, the largest and the most complex corporations you can find anywhere. 
So uh, Mark Carney, head of uh, governor of Bank of England, head of uh, Financial Stability Board, uh, recently declared the problem majorly solved somehow in Brisbane. Uh, so, and uh, I'm glad that the resolution planning was brought up because I was gonna comment on that as well. So the FSB document uh, from October 2014 uh, and is entitled Key Attributes to Effective Resolution Regimes for Financial Institutions. The date, by the way, is six years, more than six years after the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy, uh, 16 years since LTCM, the hedge fund, and 40 years after Continental Illinois, all of which showed already the uh, issue of contagion across border and uh, the challenge of resolution. And so here's what it takes us to come to just key attributes. Now, um, there's the issue that it tries to tackle, which I don't wanna go too much into. When do you start resolution? Who is gonna decide that uh, CIFI is non-viable? That point is too late. Fragilities will start way before that, and this system is so interconnected that one of those CIFIs, uh, even suspicious of uh, failing, is going to either trigger or be accompanied by more failures. There is no way, there's no collateral damage from that process in the best of all cases, but to see how far we are from um, a scenario here, let me just give you a few stats on that document. The word should appears 406 times in this document. And sometimes the should is a list of 12 things that should happen. So it's a big wish list of should, th should be things. In other words, that I mentioned very extensively, it's to do with information, authority, legal, law, power, coordination, cooperation, all of those things. I urge you to look at that document. And just remember, the Financial Stability Board has no power of enforcement at all. So all of these are just friendly suggestions to, to, to the members. So I asked the panelists here just how many of these shoulds are actually in place. How close are we to, to any number of these many, many, many shoulds that should happen to get here? Let me give you the IMF's answer from just recently. The summary sentence, as yet, Orderly resolution of systemic cross-border banks is not a feasible option. And then there's more statements about the need for political willingness to act, incentives for corporations are weak, uh, achieving progress is proving challenging. So uh, it's been a long time and I don't see any end in sight to this. So um, I would argue that progress and resolution is way, way far away uh, from being sufficient. So basically, if you argue that the system is resilient or certainly sufficiently resilient, you better hope that uh, we're not getting to that point where we need that, uh, that resolution that's so, so elusive. So what's gonna protect us from that point uh, of, uh, of failure? Supposedly these uh, tough capital requirements were told, well, I have a very dim view of those requirements. Uh, and Andrea, um, touched on uh, a couple of points, um, and I'll just uh, be stronger on that. The risk weights um, have been a source of more fragility and more interconnectedness because of a number of design flaws that manifested themselves. Measures of uh, capital to risk weighted assets have not been predictive of financial health or resiliency at all. And uh, there have been studies on that. It's not just the manipulability, it's the fact that they create concentrations uh, or on assets that uh, regulations give very low risk weights for and other things. So that system uh, is bad. And even when you go to leverage ratios, which I favor more, except not at these ridiculous levels, uh, they too are based on accounting numbers, cannot be trusted, do not give appropriate uh, warnings uh, of financial health. So I'm not under any illusion that these capital requirements are gonna help us. Even worse, and that was also mentioned by, uh, by Mr. Nria, uh, they repeat again mistakes from the past 
which want to rely on non-equity substitutes, call them the name, the, the jargon of the day, COCOs, GLAX or TLAX or Bailin, all of those things that are basically debt instruments that magically in some scenario, again, in resolution or some other time, will magically be there to absorb losses. Well, our experience has been grim, and that's the most frustrating thing about it. We should know better than to trust these things because all the regulatory capital in Basel II that was there to absorb losses actually did not absorb losses. So it just didn't work. It didn't work, memorandum of understanding, nothing worked that was in place except equity and plain equity. So uh, I, mean, I see the look. Uh, okay, I just wanna mention a couple more things. Uh, Quickly, derivatives. So uh, no capital makes sense given where we are on derivatives markets. That's an incredible source of risk and opacity that's also a source of a lot of fragility in the system. Uh, on derivatives, one of the things that is harmful is uh, bankruptcy codes like the one we have in the US which give preferential treatment to repos and derivatives allowing the counterparties to step ahead of every other creditor, including depositors. This is a huge flaw, but it's not been revisited. In other words, there are a number of other areas, I would summarize reform efforts as unfocused, sometimes too much on some issues that are not relevant to the crisis, and then too little on the things that really matter. And then they fail to learn obvious lessons that we really should know better than uh, to be here. So I'm particularly alarmed, and I'm glad that there was all the buts here. If policymakers congratulate themselves and believe that, that we've done enough, because it's very, very far from the truth, unfortunately. So millions of people are suffering from the failures of previous regulation, and I really urge those who can do it to do the obvious things, and I have very specific suggestions here that can be done right away, such as anybody who can't fail must not make any payouts to equity, and in fact must raise equity in markets, which is what they would have had to do if they had normal creditors, uh, and they were subject to normal market discipline. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So we've had three yes buts <coughs> and a no. I don't know how that adds up, actually. It's an interesting uh, a quantification. You're going to have to decide that at the end. But I think Anat has raised some quite important questions, and since it's a discussion as much as a formal debate, I'd like to pursue them, at least the three that we've ha she's raised, and, we, and one or, perhaps one or two others, very briefly. So I'd like to start, if I may, with you, Mr. Rona because she made a very strong statement, which she cited a, um, an IMF saying that orderly resolution of systemically important cross-border banks is, if I, I don't remember what the adjective is, unworkable? Not, not, not a feasible option. Not a feasible option, unworkable, but the same thing. Well, <coughs> um, uh, you run uh, what is certainly uh, uh, a GCFI, so do you agree with that statement or not? Would no, a cross-border resolution of Credit Suisse be feasible? Well, let me, let me give the Swiss answer to the proposition, which is a bit different, different, uh, different than what you just asked me. I think in, if the system, the way it's designed, if it's implemented, I'm, I would, I'm convinced that it's a workable system that would actually do away with the issue of, um, of uh, governments having to step in to resolve banks. It's doable. Um, in Switzerland, and that's contrary to what... Uh, Mr. Damati said before, and I don't know who, the, who gave that quote, but it's certainly not somebody, uh, not a Swiss uh, legislator, who did that. We were relatively quick for once in Switzerland with adopting new regulation after the financial crisis. We didn't have not, did not have some of the uh, difficulties that the, Euros, the Eurozone had in terms of economic environment as such, but we had one big bank that had to be bailed out, and we obviously have two big banks that, in comparison to the GDP, are very large. There's no doubt about that. So uh, there was, a, was an expert commission that was set up immediately and came up with a proposal that was then put into law. And I may be a bit, a bit biased because I was, I was one of the members of that committee, although I was a minority member, as you can imagine, being a representative of a big bank. We came up with a system that was based on, base, on two or three principles. Higher capital rules. Um, uh, we would have additional buffers in, uh, in terms of 
loss-absorbing capital that is not strict equity, but uh, uh, so-called contractual COCOs, convertible securities. Now, this is not something which is new. I mean, we have had uh, convertible securities for I don't know how many, how many years, uh, and quite frankly, it's also not new that banks can actually be resolved. The FDIC actually does that now for many years, yeah. thinks they have a very good system in place to do that, at least according to what they say. So we have high capital rules at the time when we agreed to it. I must say that now, uh, I was criticized quite heavily by colleagues, foreign colleagues who said, are you mad to agree to uh, 10% uh, uh, CET1 plus 3% uh, high triggering COCOS plus low triggering COCOS. So we had different categories with different attachment points. And because there was at the time at least some legal issues as to who would actually decide when those COCOS would trigger, you had to have an objective measurement to do that because you didn't want to have just one regulator do it or another, uh, because that could have created, in an in incomplete international environment, could have created some havoc. That coupled with resolution planning, with, uh, I would say, additional organizational measures that were clearly incentivized, um, gave a system that we felt was uh, a very solid one. We implemented it. We now had done a relook of that system just recently with another expert commission. It's part of, the, of, the, of, of how the, the law was set up. I have come to the conclusion that, that you know, they may, we, we may have to do some additional changes to that in certain respects. One issue that is currently debated is the issue of uh, how, uh, what, how the leverage ratio should be precisely defined, what goes in, what instruments, is it, on, is it common equity, is it actually tier one instruments, and then what, what does TLAC bring. But the basic principle of a combination of strong equity and bail inable debt is what I think this consensus also in Switzerland, that this system that is work that works. Now, the big problem that I see, or the problem that I see, is it, the system will still have some ramifications or being incomplete as long as we do not have an international alignment on how they, on, on on I would say mutual acceptance of different systems. There, I would say the the paper that you ridiculed a little bit actually does some help because if you have common standards, it facilitates, of course, mutual acceptance of of individual systems, and that will create in the end, a, a safer global system. But that is, that is where we are coming from. We are convinced that that's the right way to address the issue. But isn't this a bit, perhaps I can ask Mr. Enria this, it sort of sounds to me as an outsider, sort of a bit of, you know, if wishes were horses, uh, 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 we could all ride. I mean, the, the, the conditions under which you could have a coordinated bankruptcy or resolution process for a major institution that is operating in many jurisdictions simultaneously, all of which continue to have different laws in this area which they protect quite zealously, um, those conditions aren't realistic, are they? They're certainly not where we are now. What do you think, Mr. Even, let's leave aside the transatlantic problems, even within Europe, have we got to that point? Well, let me, let me try to give a more optimistic uh, uh, picture here. Let's say, first of all, we have the Bank Recovery Resolution Directive in Europe. So we have, for the first time, a, a common, let's say, legislative framework for recovery resolution, which changes the, uh, the, the resolution legislation in all countries. In, uh, let's say, now 19 countries out of uh, 28, we have a single resolution authority and a single supervisor. We should, of course, uh, uh, help in... Uh, in achieving a much, uh, a much stronger in, in interconnection of resolution processes. Actually, everything is built to be able to interconnect, let's say, the resolution system across countries. It is difficult. In my view, if you, if you ask me what I would have liked in this field, I would have liked to be much more ambitious. I think that after a crisis like this, I would have liked to have international treaties, a strong legal basis to cross-border resolution for reasons that, uh, of course, uh, are, are, are evident to everybody, uh, that was not uh, possible. But let's say, in terms of the regulatory dialogue we have with our colleagues, again, the, the key attributes is true. They are not legally binding. It's plenty of should, and uh, it all depends on, on national implementation. Still, let's say, for instance, when I have my dialogue, when I go outside Europe, I was mentioning I was in Hong Kong uh, the, the, the previous days, what do we do? We discuss with our fellow regulators, where are you? with the implementation of the key attributes. What do you have in place? And the, 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 the point is, is that if you don't have trust on the fact that you can resolve a bank, what will you do is ring fencing. What we have seen during the crisis is that uh, local authorities 
reinvest the banks, ask for more capital and liquidity locally, and they don't allow this capital and liquidity to move. So uh, in a sense, uh, the, the, the challenge will be to have this setting to move forward uh, to re restore this trust between home and those supervisors to allow, let's say, relying on each other and to, to make sure that if there are losses in a jurisdiction, they can be escalated to the parent company and capital will be forthcoming. If this will not be the case, we will have a much more segmented uh, global market and the European market going forward. So uh, we are definitely working in Europe and with our fellow regulators outside Europe to make this happen. It's a difficult challenge. It's a difficult challenge because it's legislation in most cases. Um, I think this leads us very naturally to a question to Mr. Padon, because uh, you are, you're here as a national minister, and essentially what you're being told by the, I'm paraphrasing, perhaps a little provocatively, uh, is that if only the governments were prepared to give up all these ridiculous residual sovereignty claims and cooperate in creating a fully functioning global uh, regulatory and legal system, then we could operate our global financial system with little problems. Um, that's more wishes were horses. I mean, my sense is that governments really rather care about how their financial systems are regulated, managed, and dealt with if they fail. Would you accept that, you know, national governments are in some fundamental way at fault here, and if, they, if it, you do accept it, is there actually any realistic solution to that problem? I think, let me go back to my initial point. This is, again, part of the process, which, however, does not involve only interaction between different uh, national jurisdictions. It mostly involves a dialogue between national jurisdictions and European jurisdictions to be or at least European approaches to problems that so far have been dealt on a national basis, both in terms of redesigned in the national system, resolution mechanism, and so forth. Of course, now we have in, the Euro in Europe some European institutions that have the mandate to develop a European not only set of rules, but approach to dealing with banking resolution. Let's face it. Re resolving a bank can rely on very specific rules, toolboxes, and all that. But of course, it also always involves some judgment. So we need to develop, in Europe at least, a common approach to how we deal with these things, and starting from different national traditions, different national systems, and different national r set of regulations. Uh, as I just said, uh, countries still have a lot of homework to move their national regulations towards a more uh, comprehensive European approach. So we need to work on the implementation of the grand design of a banking union, which includes a single resolution mechanism, single supervision mechanism, so that we make it operational. And this involves both the ECB and its supervisory uh, arm, but also Europe, meaning by Europe, Brussels and the Commission and competition rules and so forth. So we, we have a lot of work to do to move towards that common view. And uh, this is why, this is, I don't know whether this is a horse or what, whatever you mentioned. Which is what wishes, wishes. But this is certainly a, a state of mind that in my experience needs to be strengthened. And so far, we, I, have understand, I understood that we could do more, otherwise, we may find ourselves stuck in different approaches between different national regulators and European regulators, European authorities. We have to, to move towards that way, and since we're doing it, getting out of a crisis, let's do it in a way that also benefits growth so that we can implement more easily those those rules. That would be my, so, and my that's plea. You, you've got a minute to express how far you've been persuaded by these answers, and then I will ask. Nice you. words, and this, we're nowhere, nowhere. And I'm involved in the FDIC effort, and the closest I've seen is the UK US uh, understandings. And even there, there is an asymmetry in terms of single point of entry. We're nowhere. If we had hours, we could go through the hundreds of issues that require legal changes in many countries that are nowhere in the hopes uh, to achieve anytime soon. I'm going to allow you to participate. Um, 
the rules are as follows. You can please, if you, I ask you to make to, to to speak, say who you are, ask a question. If you want to make a point, you have 20 seconds, and I will be rude because there isn't much time, uh, and therefore focus on just one narrow issue. Um, and uh, so to give the opportunity to people to respond uh, in the last few minutes. So, uh, and I will take quite a number of questions or points together and then sort of decide how to allocate them. So does anybody want to, to inject, interject? Yes, please. Uh, this gentleman, say who you are and... Uh, and Giovanni, <coughs> Giovanni Bossi, Banca IFIS. Is there a level of capital at which you, you think that the system is safe? Huh? We'll, we'll come to that in a moment. So, again, uh, that's a very good question, and uh, we will move to it. Next, anybody else want to ask a question? You are speechless. Ah, no, the gentleman over there, sorry. Uh, Alec, Alex Smith from Reuters. Um, should the banks now be broken up? Okay. Okay, should banks be broken up? This gentleman here? Wonderfully short questions, I love them. To, Ger to Chairman Ronner, perhaps uh, Minister Padron, is there anything in the system today coming off Bulgarian Cardiac Institute? Is there anything what justifies leading by surprise in the regulatory system, particularly in the last uh, week's events? If you're afraid to criticize the Swiss bank, please uh, pass, the, pass it to Minister Are you Padron. talking about exchange rate management, possibly? <laughs> I mean, uh, leading uh, by surprise in the regulatory system, including uh, taking uh, 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 okay. uh, abrupt surprise. decisions. Uh, I will, I, a little stretching it, but we will see how we do on that one. Uh, uh, um, this lady over here on the right, P, please. Sylvie Matera, Deutsche Bank. By focusing very much on the resolution and uh, with the risk of handing with too much fragmentation, don't you think we miss the main point that for banks to be safe, which would be allowed to have good risk diversification, mainly we should die safely, but we need to live first. Okay, that's an directly linked to the, the, the broken, the, should banks be broken up issue. Yes, okay, that's very good. Um, we're doing very, very well. Uh, this gentleman here. Thank you very much. Richard Edgar from uh, ICV News. Um, Professor Admati, I've read your book. It's very simple. Why do you think that the gentlemen to your right don't agree with you? Left. My right, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay. Um, anybody, uh, gentleman over there? Wences Casares from SAPO. What do you guys think of narrow banking? Okay, I think I've got enough questions to keep us going for a while. Um, I'm going to start with should banks be broken up, which I can tie with the question of isn't there immense advantage to risk diversification, um, so why banks should not be broken up. Uh, if you want to, in that context, since it obviously implies a breakup, you could also th consider narrow banking. I think those two, three questions actually fit together very, uh, very well. I'm going to start. I'm actually I'm going to start on those linked questions: breakup, diversification, narrow banking, um, with you, Mr. Rona, if I may. Um, Should you have been broken up? Well, you wouldn't, wouldn't be surprised to hear me say yeah, no. Of course but, not. but the obvious question is why not? Because I, I think, I mean, risk diversification being one, one crucial element, I think that's, um, and you, you could prove that also empirically. I think it makes much more sense um, that uh, to, to have the risk well diversified. In, in breaking up banks will not do anything to make the system safer. And if you look at when you can actually even go back to 2008 and you look which banks have failed, some of them actually were fairly focused banks, take Northern Rock as an example, uh, or, or others that had very little to do with uh, basically either the size or particular particular businesses that were in. And actually, the the, the, the problems that faced that that you know came up were uh, were spread out, spread around in many different segments of banking. But in interestingly enough, not typically at universal banks that uh, had uh, fairly diverse, uh, diversified risks. There were three fairly large diversified universal banks, so they were very, very large that did have to be rescued, and you actually mentioned one of them. 
one of them was in my country and one of them was in the US. So it wouldn't be safe to say that diversified and gigantic universal banks are completely risk-free. And if they do yeah. fail, the costs are rather yeah. large. No, of, of course, um, but nobody would argue that uh, that banking as such is a is a risk-free business per se. I mean, risk management is is a cardinal thing of running a bank. That's part of, of what banks do and what, what their raison d'etre is. Does anyone here want to argue in favour of thinking, of, because it's a European discussion at the moment, in terms of at least partial uh, ring fencing, breaking up of banks. Mr. Enria, would, do you have, have any views on this? The Lickenham proposals, for example, which are not break up, but are sort of going in the direction of partial uh, break up. Well, if, if I may continue, I mean, the point to me is uh, we have seen systemic problems being caused by large, uh, complex institutions, which had to be bailed out. In Europe, we have seen also big problems caused by small uh, Irish banks or small Spanish cajas. So the issue is, to me, resolvability. So whether a bank is resolvable. If, if you are convinced as a supervisor, as an, as an authority, that in a crisis you can resolve a bank, I don't think that there is a strong argument for breakup. If uh, you uh, have doubts about that, and it's a tough call, eh? I'm, I'm, co I'm concerned as supervisors on having these type of powers, but if you are not convinced that you are able to manage uh, with, a, with a bank in a, in a resolution, I think that you should uh, have the guts to break it up. But and that isn't the, your argument, if I understood your argument, that very large, complex cross-border banks are just much more difficult to resolve. Well, definitely they are. Uh, now, I'm gonna answer a few questions at once, and my answer fundamentally is that uh, I want the markets to decide on the size, ideally, and the markets are deciding on the sizes of most companies. When we had a lot of conglomerates formed, they broke up on the fact that they were too uh, inefficient to be together as a, corp as a conglomerate. Banks don't shrink because uh, it pays to be big in banking more than it should because the status of too big to fail is beneficial, funding is cheap, and so you're enabled uh, in the pursuit of excessive size and excessive risk. So uh, if you subject the banks to market pricing of their funding to investors in the market that care about upside and downside as well uh, uh, and are less able, to lay the downsides on others, then you might see uh, a more natural break uh, up of the banks. And there are beginning to be a little bit of noises about that because of governance problems, because they seem to be out of control uh, in terms of the fines and all these other things, despite all the subsidies. So my short answer uh, uh, here is that uh, a whole lot more capital among the numerous benefits will uh, reduce unsized, uh, outsized subsidies and will force uh, much more equity into uh, this and therefore the sensibilities that come with that, which is appropriate pricing uh, of, of, uh, uh, of the assets and um, therefore less restrictions on diversification, which is not touched by this diversification of assets. And this is directly linked, since it was a yeah. question to you, how much capital is enough? Well, I don't really go there because it's all about the measurement. So the devil is in the denominator. And uh, there are many ways to do the denominator here. And I mentioned derivatives and I mentioned off balance sheet. And so, you know, there's risk weights issues and there's thousands of calibration questions. And so, when we say 20 to 30 percent, we say 30 percent. Those are ratios that were even in banking. Those are ratios that, that without any regulation, corporations don't go under unless they're really on the way down. So there is, on risk taking and being in, there's nothing specifically risky about banks. Uh, I come from Silicon Valley and there's much more risk taken there, much more long-term risk with the, the, the possibility of total loss and much more risky than a bunch of loans. Uh, it's backed appropriately by equity money, no problem with that. So there's no question that nothing about banking justifies living on single digit uh, equity. Nothing at all. Everything banks do, they can do better with more equity. So, and then the size will maybe settle itself 
so that, that's my answer. I, I cannot get into the numbers until we, we discuss seriously the calibration issues, and those are just a can of worms because of accounting numbers and wh which signals are you using and all of that. So uh, for five years now, I've been trying to get into that part, but we're still in the other question, which is why they don't accept the basic points. Uh, it's been my mystery for five years. Uh, it appears to be a combination of self-interest and, uh, and politics. Uh, implicit guarantees are not on budgets, very easy subsidies to give. Um, and uh, there's a political symbiosis uh, that takes many forms, and there appear to be shocking confusions about basic things that uh, we fail students in basic corporate finance classes uh, that somehow haven't made their way into banking uh, that are really bread and butter finance, like leverage and risk and risk and return that seem to be um, somehow not understood. I don't know why. Can I just, uh, I'd like you to have the last word, but I'd also like you to address, I perhaps a big, big, I, want a, I don't want a last word, I want a word. You want a word, well, okay. okay. <laughs> On this, but uh, the, okay. the responsibility of governmental institutions, broadly defined, for avoiding adding to the shocks in the system seems to me quite a relevant question. It's an unfair question to ask, but uh, the, the it's Possibly. Okay, the response- But important. Yeah, uh, well, I can pick any answer to that because I could, uh, but before I do that, let me go back to the point of breaking up banks. This is one question. You could turn it around and ask the opposite question. Uh, shouldn't we have uh, concerns about banks that are too small to prosper? It's not just too big to fail, but also too small to prosper. Uh, the responsibility of uh, governments uh, from that point of view is what I would call a structural responsibility to implement uh, reforms implement frameworks that can allow a smooth transition to a new equilibrium in size, dimension, allocation of, of the system. This has to be done in Europe, I'm sorry to be so boring and go back to the point, both by countries and by European authorities. We still don't have a clear strategy towards our view of a full banking union and a full capital markets union. We must do more. So this is one area where I think European policymakers, I'm not talking about the US and other parts of the world, I'm talking about Europe where I see more problems uh, with the addition of the se se national segmentation still very much present. So this is what I see a practical challenge for policymakers. Okay, at this stage I'm going to, because I think we're coming to the end, uh, I'm going to ask you to vote again on the same motion in the light of this very deep and I think very interesting discussion, which is, uh, and at this way, time I will remember the way round it is, what is positive, what is negative. We believe that post-crisis reforms have made the financial system sufficiently resilient. And while you vote, I would uh, just note in a brief summary that um, there's been a very interesting discussion, but there obviously continues to be some very important concerns about uh, uh, the adequacy of loss absorption, though obviously improved, about too big to fail, and the capacity to resolve very large financial, globally, global financial institutions. That's linked with a, very closely linked with the profound question about the, the manageability of the global regulatory process, which I think is very intimately related. There are some important questions about how well this regulatory process has been integrated with the, the needs of economies from a macroeconomic point of view, and that seems to me a very deep issue. And finally, obviously, lots of concern expressed by at least one participant on derivatives, the way the bankruptcy process is, operates in relation to the derivatives. So, so, but even from those who people who basically thought, yes, there are really a lot of buts, and that's very important. So now, I think, have we had enough time to process the votes. Uh, are you able to do so and everybody feel comfortable? So let's go and see what, the, what it looks like now. Ah, well it appears that the, the no's have done very well against the yes buts. Perhaps there were so many buts with the yeses. So uh, now this is very interesting. So the conclusion is 23% of you now think that it is sufficiently resilient. Uh, down from, was it 32 before? Um, 
Now, the interesting thing is apparently there was a public vote among 150 people, not randomly selected, I presume, I don't know how it was done, <laughs> on, the, on the social media platform. Uh, uh, and they didn't have the opportunity to vote twice. But interestingly, you will be interested to know how different you are from the public at large, how we, you can decide, because I'm, I'm of course neutral, uh, how much wiser or less you are, that in the public vote, 66% agreed, as against your 23%, and 34% disagreed against your 77%. So you are a very different sample of the world, and you were, and you were even before you started. Maybe that tells you something about the people who wanted to come to this panel. I think it's been a really good discussion. Obviously, can't cover all the issues, but it has allowed us to focus on the fundamental point which comes about even if you're not in quite as pessimistic as an art is or even not as pessimistic as an art that there remains a lot to do and that uh, and that if things went seriously wrong again we could again be in a very very large mess and since that happens to be the lesson uh, I draw in my book, uh, which of course you should have all read by now, I feel very comforted by this very informed discussion that I wasn't far wrong, but not comforted as far as the future of our economies is concerned, because it means that we really have to hope that we won't have another major crisis because we don't seem to be too confident that that would go very well. So may I thank the uh, the panelists and the audience for particularly and all the people who manage this technology so impressively. I think that it's been very enjoyable. Thank you very much.